and welcome back to Talking Ball, brought to you by HP Polly. I'm Nicola Hume. We are here in Milton Keynes talking all things Oracle Red Bull Racing. Now, in this episode, we are championing the top female talent here at Red Bull. It's actually quite exciting to be joined by three incredible women that play a crucial role in the progression and the development of the team. So let's start things off with uh, guest number one, somebody that you might recognise from the pit wall. It is Principal Strategy Engineer Hannah Schmitz. Hi. Secondly, an absolute vital cog in the team's floor building and wind tunnel testing. It is Aerodynamics Engineer Anna Groom. Hello. And finally, one of the team behind the magic of the sim is simulated terrain modeler Roseanne Elvin. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. <laughs> yeah. have, we, have we taken a lot of time out of your busy day for you to come and have a chat with us? It's nice. It's nice to do something different and yeah, yeah get away from the business of the day. It'll yeah. always be a busy day. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I was going to say, because actually, as we're recording, we're kind of building up to a race weekend. So does that make everything just that little bit busier for you guys for me definitely like because obviously the race is kind of when all the race strategy happens yeah. so the build-up is really busy for us mm -hmm. um but yeah I mean for me we're working more towards um the next floor upgrade deadline so that's coming in the next few weeks I want to chat to you about that in a minute <laughs> what about you Rosanne uh the F1 bit doesn't um affect me at all <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later on. But first of all, I want to start uh, with you, Hannah, if that's all right. Because sure. actually, I don't know if you know this, but in the last episode, we had a chat with Adrian Newey. And I said on the episode, if anyone that was listening or watching wanted to hear from anyone in particular on this podcast, let us know. Your name came up a lot, oh. a lot. You <laughs> seem to be quite a recognisable voice now here at Red Bull. How does that make you feel? Um, yeah, I feel like that's a bit of additional pressure, but I guess pressure is kind of what we're used to in our <laughs> job, so that's fine. And I think it's nice, you know, as you kind of touched on earlier, you don't always see that many female engineers. And so I think it's great if it can help inspire the next generation and just show that really no matter who you are, there's a place for you here. Um, yeah, and you can do a job that you really love and that you really find exciting. So let's chat about your time here at Red Bull. So how long have you been working here? Um, so I've been here 14 years now. I think it's 14 years this month. So yeah. That's a long time. It's a long time, yeah. So straight from um, when I graduated, I've always worked at Red Bull. Um, beforehand, I worked more in vehicle dynamics side of things. And then I moved into strategy. I've been in strategy about 12 and a half years now. Well, here's the thing, right? How did you realise that you were good at strategy? Did you kind of realise that you had a knack for it? It's not something you normally study at university. How did you end up in exactly. this job? Yeah, exactly. So that's actually loads of people are always asking, yeah, how can I do it? Is there a race strategy degree? No, there definitely isn't. It's just all about problem solving and enjoying that kind of strategic way of thinking, I guess. So for me, like in our personal time, we play lots of board games. So that was kind of a um, I guess, like a hint that I would like that kind of thing. And then once I started at Red Bull, I got to know people that worked in the strategy department and became friends with them socially and then learned more and more about the role and realized that's kind of what I wanted. I wanted to be more directly connected to the races and a bit more know quite a lot about everything, but not necessarily be a specific um, like expert in any like particular part of detail. And that's what I like about strategy. So you have to know a lot about everything that's going on and take all this information in and then decide what that means for the big picture and make the decisions. Um, and that's what I really enjoy. So when you are trackside, um, how do you manage to stay calm? Because I guess it's a lot of planning, but also a lot of flexibility at the same time in stressful situations. Yes, that's. I think that sums it up perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, you've always got plans and you, everything's in place. But I think you've always got to be adaptable when you're sitting on that seat and make sure you're not too kind of, well, before the race, I said I was going to only do a one stop. So I don't mind that it's now a two stop race. You know, you've always got to be adaptable and, and change your decisions. Um, for me, I think it's the time when I'm most calm because there's so much adrenaline. I, you finally feel like that responsibility. This is your job. It's the thing you're here to do. And so I think for me, it's just a sense of calm comes over me when the start lights go out and that's kind of right I'm here to do this job I've got to stay calm and make these decisions so 
So when, because you actually share your your trackside time with Will Courtney. So when he's trackside at the pit wall, where are you and what are you doing? Um, So then I'm in the operations room here in Milton Keynes um, and then helping make sure all the information. So that's really where we're doing all the detailed analysis of all the data and passing that information on to that person on the pit wall so that they can make the decision. So making sure that information is passed on in the way that I know I would want to receive it. Um, So it really helps us alternating the role because we each know what it's like to be that person there. And so we know exactly that information. If we overhear, like we have so much support in the ops room, people helping us. So if we overhear someone saying, oh, this driver commented this on the radio, be like, yeah, that's important, pass it on. Um, So yeah, that again is another yeah, really interesting role to do. And I think kind of having the split makes us really strong as a team. So I get, do you kind of like a, you approach each race like it's a puzzle in a way? Yes, I think that's a good way of putting it. Exactly. I always say it's really like playing a board game. It's just the results really matter. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you've got to get it right. Um, and obviously, your drivers aren't necessarily pieces as well that you can always make move in the way you want to. So it's about... Um, understanding the limitations of the car and always managing risk, really. So it's never a right and wrong answer, unfortunately. Um, So it's all about balancing the risk and taking on all the information, the data and the opinions of people, which I think is what makes it really unique. It's not just about the numbers. You can just write a formula and go and do that strategy and it always win. It's about also taking on, yeah, what's the weather doing? What's this person's opinion? Does what's the driver's feeling? Um, so there's lots of different things to. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Is a, a, a lot of people have an opinion when it comes to a strategy of, of each race. So how much do you take on board from Christian or from Max or from Checo? How much do you take on board from them without kind of going? I think you might be wrong, and I might be right. <laughs> I think it's always important to like have the belief in in yourself as well. And you are the person there that's run all the simulations overnight and you know what you're talking about, but you shouldn't just ignore people either. So for example, on paper, two tire compounds might look very similar in terms of lap time and grip, but the driver will say, I just feel like way better on this tire and I can push more in traffic. And I know it might be a little bit slower, but for me, that's better. Then you would obviously take that opinion on board. But if the driver is saying, "Oh, I definitely can't do a stint of twenty laps on that tire," and you know from your data that they can, and that's what they need to try and do in order for you to win the race, it might not be the easiest thing, but that's what we need to do. Um, then you would communicate that to them. So yeah, we have a lot of conversations before the race. We all know what the situation is going into the race and when we might adapt that. So the drivers know what comments to feed back to us that would help us kind of adapt the strategy if we need to. I mean, it's it's been an unbelievable start for Red Bull for this yes, season. It's it been, been incredible. Good. So being on the pit wall, being trackside for all of those wins, how has that been? Yeah, I mean, it's been amazing. It's, as you say, it's a great year. And obviously there's a big buzz in, in the team. Mm. But I think also everyone's still very driven. There's still a lot of pressure. I think people would think, oh, you're, it's just easy, but not at all. I think we always feel like we want to make the right decisions when you are faster obviously you can make a mistake and probably it would be okay but our kind of I don't our MO as the team maybe is not to do that we don't want to kind of sit back and relax and become comfortable we want to still always be making the right decisions still having those heated discussions so actually nothing has changed in that respect but I mean it's still it's still a celebration with, with every win so yeah. is the celebration different trackside compared to the celebration when you're here at the factory during a race um, apart I... from the amount of champagne you get in your hair <laughs> <laughs> well I think on both sides you get some bubbles so yeah, that's nice. fine <laughs> um not really I mean we obviously all the engineers we have the bubbles we get to do the team photo with the drivers after the race but then actually we fly home that same night so it's not like a massive party party all the time um and then here everyone yeah gets to have some bubbles and then quite a few of the guys that work there will all go out um and have a pizza together or something like that so I think you do get that kind of team spirit and the celebration wherever you are so when you are on the pit wall how important are the team back here at the factory during a race they're it's quite a critical thing having both sides going on 100% like you couldn't do it without them they 
are giving you all the information you need to make those decisions. So, and things always change in the race and are different to how you expect. Um, so yeah, we couldn't do it without any one of them. And you definitely notice maybe when there's a bit less support than usual, like, so 100% we need all those people. Well, I do have to say it's a really lovely atmosphere here at the factory. It's really nice. I mean, you're based here, aren't you, Anna? You're based here at the factory. Yeah, yeah, I'm based here. So how long have you been working for Red Bull? Um, So it's coming up to four years for me. Um, So as well, like Hannah, I joined straight out of uni. um, And yeah, coming up to, to four years later this summer. Can I just say, um, joining straight in with Red Bull F1, <laughs> straight out of uni, that's bonkers. That's bonkers, right? <laughs> I mean, well, a lot of people, like, that's a big target. To be able to get straight here, straight from uni, that's huge. It, well, I'm definitely, like, lucky to have ended up here. Also, I mean, worked hard to to get here. But yeah, it, definitely a good place to be straight out of uni, that's for sure. So did you have F- F1 as your target while you were studying at uni? Is this kind of the dream where you wanted to be? Um, so for me, it was always cars or planes. That's what I was interested in. It definitely like rubbed off from my dad. I was just fascinated by the engineering side of, of both of them. And so throughout uni, I did some placements in aerospace, did some in motorsport, and then kind of the the pace of motorsport was a little bit faster than aerospace and I yeah. found that quite exciting as well. Um, so yeah, tried my luck when it came to graduating with with applying for jobs and yeah, ended up here and, and the four years has flown by. I mean, so now you're kind of working not just with the factory team, but you're also working with the track team. Is that right? Um, so yeah, so this year I'm spending a bit of time in the ops room as well, supporting um, the aero performance group who mm. are who are analysing the, the aero data track side as well as then doing my usual job in development and developing aero parts for the car. So you were saying that you're now working on the floor upgrade for what's coming up next. So how much can you tell us about like how much work has to go into an upgrade and how much of a change is an upgrade (laughs) from what's on the current car? Well, it's um, in season, a lot of it tends to be quite evolutionary in that we all have the, the floor that we've been running so far this year and we're constantly applying small tweaks and changes to try and get more performance out of that. Um, but it's kind of a constant cycle of every day we're submitting simulations, CFD simulations, analysing those results, putting together wind tunnel programmes to then build a, a whole kind of upgrade package and ultimately that's what then arrives at track. But it's it's a constant cycle of trying to eke little bits of performance out. Well, this is what I was wondering if you're, if you tend to work race to race or if you're planning further ahead, like if you're working year on year, or if you're working race to race, which, which one is it? Or are you doing all of the things? <laughs> well, in, um, within the kind of development teams in aerodynamics, it's, um, not so much race to race because we'll finalize our floor upgrade and then that needs to go to have the physical parts and tooling designed. It needs to go through manufacture. So there's a bit of a lag between finalizing those designs and it actually hitting the track. So the kind of development timelines are somewhat out of sync with the races but then in the aero performance side of things it's very much race to race and that they are your kind of markers you know that's that's where you're um kind of making sure that your um your kind of software is you know primed and ready to get the information you'll need you're checking that those upgrades are then performing how you're expected so the kind of two elements are somewhat different but yeah. obviously all all fit together in the end. So I, I mean, I have to ask about the wind tunnel. So for like a, normal people that don't work within Formula One, will we hear, oh, wind tunnel, and you just kind of try to make a picture in your head of what an actual wind tunnel is. So I, I imagine there's just a car that's sat in a room and you throw a load of wind at it and then see where the air goes. Am I right? <laughs> um, loosely, <laughs> we could go with that. No, we, um, we have a, a scaled down model of the car. So that's it's restricted by the FIA in terms of the size that the model can ah, be and the okay. speed of the wind that comes over it. So we've got a scaled down model of the car and it kind of sits on a treadmill and so that simulates the road and then we have a big fan that um sends the air over and it's kind of a closed loop so it circulates around and puts the air over the over the model car so on track 
the road and the air are stationary and we move the car through it. Yeah. Whereas in the wind tunnel, the car is stationary and we're moving the road and the air relative to the car to try and kind of simulate what's going on. And then we've got all sorts of um, load cells and pressure taps and things on the model car so that we can change geometries and then see the data that's coming off of that and if it's behaving as we're we expect or not that's amazing that's good that's complete i didn't <laughs> i didn't imagine it to be like that but do, do you also kind of add in weather and things like that so like if it's raining how will the car handle the wind is that not, also done in the wind tunnel not too much in the wind tunnel right. so we can um do things like we can simulate different wind angles so we can yaw the model so that the the wind isn't always coming straight onto the car we can simulate it at different angles to kind of get an idea if it's a windy day or as you're going around the corner how the car might respond to the different um different onset angles of the air but yeah water rain is not something that right. we can incorporate with it so how how important is wind tunnel time we definitely feel the pinch having our budget reduced. Um, we're limited on how much time we can spend in the tunnel, how many different runs that we can do. So it's it's very important that we plan ahead. That is so interesting. As as, as someone who I would I wouldn't even know where to begin when it comes to sort of designing a car, designing the underfloor, and all that sort of stuff. It's so fascinating to hear how much work gets put into it. So I guess when it comes to the floor upgrades that are coming, they've already been in the wind tunnel you already know what you can achieve from that it, it's a constant cycle yeah. yeah so um I mean the floor upgrades that we've sent already this year um they will be you know several weeks if not months of work that's kind of accumulating and you're adding bits and pieces to the package and between the whole team of people um everyone's kind of contributing their ideas and trying to make things that that work together so it's very much a group effort to yeah. to get them there yeah so if it is weeks and months at a time, I guess right now you could be working on something that could be more towards the end of the season? Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. So where we are at the moment is looking at um, upgrades for the second half of the season and what we can gotcha. bring later this year. So Roseanne, you work for a part of Red Bull that not a lot of people would know about. It's uh, the Red Bull Advanced Technologies, which is more commonly known as RBATS. Can you tell us a bit about your role with them? Yeah, it's quite um, hidden from the public what we do. So, um, Are you allowed to tell us about it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but visually we don't we don't show people because um, it's, it's technology we want to keep private. So um so yeah I started at Red Bull in 2016 and for five and a half years like I said I worked for the F1 simulator mm -hmm. building the visual representation of the circuits. So that Max and Checo and um Alban and everybody else who's been a driver since I started has has um, been able to see the graphics that I've done and use that for the performance testing. So um Yes, yeah, so I did that for five and a half years. And then the last two years I've worked for Red Bull Advanced Technologies and my job role has kind of changed a bit. So um, I am a simulation terrain modeler and I still do that for a lingy Red Bull racing. So essentially you kind of, you've taken everything that you've learned from F1 and put it into the sailing team. <laughs> yes, basically, <Right>? yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, I've seen some of the videos of the sailing team and it's, it, it's faster than I was expecting. Like it's completely blown my mind how quick that they go and, and all the sort of science and that that goes behind the sailing team, not just yeah. the Formula One team. It blew my mind when I first started working on it. It's a lot more complicated than working on a static um, road surface, for instance. Um, so did you... Uh, so before you joined Red Bull, did you study engineering or were you kind of a more of an artistic kind of person? Yeah. How did, you, how did you end up where you are? <laughs> so I did a degree in creative visualisation and I actually thought I was going to work in the movie industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just by chance, I ended up working for, um, it was a different motorsport company um, about 14 years ago. Mm. And they were working on a new Formula One car, but they also did... Um, LMP1, LMP2, um, Formula E, IndyCar, and some of, just, they did everything. Um, and then, so I worked, worked um, on the simulator there, and then I brought that knowledge over to Red Bull. I have to, I have to ask you about the, about the simulator stuff that you've done over the last sort of five years, because I wouldn't even know where to begin with designing. Uh, it's, it's, do you treat it like approaching, designing a computer game, and then you kind of go in that direction to then make it realistic for the drivers while they're training? Uh, yeah, I, I 
this is how I always explain it to other people. It's just like making a computer game. Oh, oh right, <laughs> yeah. okay. But um, but I don't design anything. It's already exists, and I'm just trying to make it look as believable as possible because the graphics is also quite important for a simulator. Um to help with uh, motion sickness in order for it to be believable you, you have to make the graphics look as believable as possible yeah. and and that's what helps prevent the motion sickness okay so so when it came to sort of uh, a track that didn't that didn't exist yet let's say for example let's say for example you're still working in in simulations and we're now approaching vegas which is a track that's never been driven before it yeah. exists but it has never been driven as a track before so how would you go about creating that and making that as realistic as possible when technically it doesn't exist, exist. <laughs> yeah so um it, it's quite hard yeah <laughs> so we we normally get um like um the gps lines or something like that from the fia so we know the track edges where they would be and the elevations um so that's a good starting point and then we we would actually use like Google Earth or something to have a, <laughs> just to see what it should look like. Yeah. But then we have our own um, library of materials and textures and we make our own um, to make things look as real as possible, but, but with to something that looks believable to what Las Vegas would look like. So, um, because we you can't obviously copy stuff from Google Earth and you wouldn't want to because the quality wouldn't be as good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Yeah, so normally on a race weekend, we get a lot of point cloud data and that's um, it's like point point um, representation of where things actually exist in the real world, it's like X, Y, Z point data. Um, and that that helps us to know where to put a curb and where um, where like the runoffs would be, um, how high the runoffs would be. Um, and then we use that to, to model basically. <laughs> Okay. So, but actually, I mean, the same question kind of goes for you, Hannah, when it comes to Vegas, a track that doesn't exist, how do you start prepping for your strategy for that? Yeah. So, um, we get some measurements from the track, kind of like Roseanne said, we'll get GPS lines, we'll get a, a track layout drawing. So we'll know that. Um, and then we'll also get some data from the simulator. So after all the great work, making so it as realistic okay. as possible, no <laughs> <laughs> the drivers will have a go in the simulator first and we we'll, can use some of that data to help us with things as well. So we'll get like a speed profile. We'll use that to help us estimate as well how long it takes to make a pit stop, things like that. Um, and then we'll also get data, actual measurements from the track before we get there. So like the roughness of the track surface. That's the which thing. For you us, don't know how it's going to affect the tyres. Exactly. Yeah. The tyres are one of the major things so for us it's like tires and overtaking then we can put all those things into our simulations but we'll run more simulations than usual because we know less information so we'll sweep um do a larger sweep um than we usually would um but still i mean when you go to the race you've got to decide which tires you're using in p1 and then p2 so it's not like we can just wait and see mm. we've already had to make decisions which will impact what we can do in the race so do, do, do you three know each other? Yeah. <laughs> yes. You do? do. Yeah. Is that bit, so do you ever get to kind of bump into each other and kind of work together and develop things together? Or is it just a case of bumping into each other while you're here at the factory? I've worked with Hannah before because I used to help with um, volunteer for the ops room. Um, yes. When, um, when I used to work for the F1 side. Exactly. Nice. So yeah. as I was saying, all that vital support we need. So um, students obviously help us out a lot of weekends and then staff are, are welcome to volunteer and help us out, like listening to driver radios and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, some great stuff sometimes like too, because obviously it's really interesting to kind of feel part of the race yeah. and it's actually quite a nice environment it really to work makes in. you feel like you're part of the team when you do the option room because you really get to feel what actually goes on behind the scenes because it's quite because yeah, this great. place is so vast this factory is just i mean it's massive here that you would assume it might be quite rare for someone for three of you in three completely different departments knowing each other well enough and sort of working together is actually quite nice to see i wasn't expecting yeah. it and I think also because there aren't, you don't always see as many women around the factory. Sometimes we will do things like go for a walk at lunch or things mm. like that. I mean, we haven't actually done that for a while. So. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. do try the to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the intentions there. So like there is a little bit of a network if you want. I was, I was going to yeah. say, actually, myself walking around the factory, I have spotted quite a few women walking around. Is this something that you've noticed an improvement in? 
Oh, definitely. definitely. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. when I started, I think there were like seven of us at all in the DO. Now right. that I feel like there's a lot more. So, I love yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've worked in automotive and all of that for, for a few years. So I know what it feels like to be a woman in a, what is predominantly a men's industry, but actually it's, it's quite nice to see so many ladies doing so well. And it's so inspirational for young girls seeing you three sat in this, sat in these seats, doing what you've done, learning what you've learned and being sat where you're sat, which, you know, a few years ago probably wouldn't have happened. So it's quite nice. So here on Talking Ball, uh, we have a game that we like to call 100 Objects. I'm fully aware that having 100 is quite a high target, but, you know, every guest that we're going to get on the podcast is going to bring in an item that is significant to their time here at Red Bull, something that means a lot to them. So when we had Christian Horner on, he brought in the Constructors Trophy, and then we had Adrian Newey, who brought in his legendary notebook and pen that was pretty epic. So I can see the three of you have brought some things in. So we'll start with you, Roseanne. What have you brought in with you? Uh, I've brought in my laptop (laughs) (laughs) okay tell us about the laptop so it's actually a cool story I think because um because of covid actually um I didn't have a laptop until covid happened and um so I used a desktop all the time it was really hard to do um to learn new things and apply them to work on the go like quickly and I found that having a laptop just massively helped me develop my skills so I was literally sat on my with my laptop the other day thinking what can I bring into this and then I thought it's got to be a laptop because I'm on it all the time (laughs) So there's a lot in that laptop yeah. that it must be kept secret, I guess, or there's just a lot of details of things that you're doing yeah. with uh, with Arbats and putting that towards the sailing team. That is all inside of that laptop. Everything, yeah. It's a very precious item that is going into our Hall of Fame. Lovely stuff. Anna, what have you brought with you? Um, I've brought a wind tunnel barge board. Um, sure. So That is definitely a wind tunnel barge board because <laughs> I see them all the time. <laughs> it's... Talk us through I mean, the item. Certainly much smaller than the real car barge board because that couldn't fit on my lap. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, the wind tunnel model is all scaled down. So this is from the RB15, which was the first car that I worked on when I joined. Um, and obviously with the regulation change, the current cars don't have this kind of intricacy. Um, but it's quite interesting to look back and see. Um, and I mean, it's all the part on on the actual car is one big part, but this is all modular. So all of these individual winglets and things can all be changed. So when we're developing, we might just be changing a few of these little things, some of these panels, and and then you kind of gradually, as I was saying earlier, where we kind of piece things together to get a full upgrade package. This is, you know, several iterations in CFD and several different wind tunnel tests come together to the upgrade that we then sent to track. So the the little nodules and stuff that are on there, like if you were to move one a centimetre, would that make a huge difference? Um, yeah, certainly when you when you combine them all, you could do things like changing the heights of these, changing the profile. If you if you take a slice through these winglets, they're all an aerofoil profile like you would have on the wing of an airliner, but obviously much smaller. And so, you know, all of those profiles can be changed as well as the relationships, the way we kind of cascaded a few of them together, the, you know, the relationships between each of those elements can change as well. Amazing. That is another item that's going into our Hall of Fame. Fantastic. And Hannah, what have you brought with you? Cool. I'm not sure I can really follow this because it's extremely (laughs) exciting and interesting. Um, But I've just bought um, a pair of headphones because for me, um, growing up, watching the Formula One races, I, I remember saying to my grandma, when I'm older, I want to be the person, one of the people wearing the headphones. Obviously, at that time, I didn't really have a good grasp of all the different jobs you could do and be a person wearing the headphones. But for me, in my like childlike simplicity, it was, oh, I really want to be one of those people working at the race. So for me, when I got to sit there and wear the headphones, that was like the realisation of my dreams. Have you had like the same pair of headphones this Uh, whole time and refused to change them? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe because, I mean, we just get given them at the track and it has your name on. So maybe. potentially, but I think someone hopefully does clean them and take them away at times. <laughs> <laughs> that would be handy if they did clean them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's time for Ask Red Bull. So we've got members of the Oracle Red Bull Racing Paddock to submit some questions to you. Now, our first two are actually via video, which is very nice. So let's go to question number one. Hi, I'm Chloe from London. Um, Hi, Hannah, Anna and Roseanne. A big fan. I've got a quick question, if that's okay. So how much more do you think can be done to get equal representation in F1? And do you think there will ever be a female driver on the grid? 
Do you, do you think we'll ever see a female driver on the grid? Yes. I certainly hope so yeah. with all the initiatives that are going on now. Mm. It's really encouraging how much support it's all getting. Yeah. Do you have a, a, a lot of friends within your sort of friend circle that are F1 fans that are girls that you're like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if you kind of, if your daughter or whatever would like to grow up and work in F1? And I guess with the, with the three of you working in it and being inspirational to, to young girls, it's just going to get bigger and better, right? Yeah, really hope so. Like uh, I have two young girls myself, so I'm always like, oh, what do you think about karting? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, do it, do it. But I mean, it's I'm expensive, but trying, do it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm trying hard to not, because obviously I've, well, I've been pushing like the cars and the trains and the building blocks. And then I realized the other day when my daughter came home and said, oh, all the girls at school know more about princesses. I was like, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. We should cover that as well. So we do need to be <laughs> Princesses can drive their own cars. Her. They can, exactly. Yeah. So we do need to let them do whatever they want to do. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's the important thing. I think it's not that we're saying, oh, women must work in motorsport. We're just saying that people should feel free to work where they want and not feel like it's a barrier because it is currently a male-dominated sport. So hopefully yeah. us talking to you shows that, you know, anyone can do this, everyone can feel included. And yeah, you should just really look for a job that you're going to enjoy. And like motorsport and Formula One have so many things to offer people. Um, so I know at Rebel we're doing quite a lot of things to try and encourage more diversity. We've mm -hmm. got International Women in Engineering Day coming up where some people are going to come to the factory and we'll get to come and chat to us all in person and we can really share those experiences and, and answer people's questions. So, yeah, we're trying to do what we can. But I think, yeah, just talking about what we do and showing people that there's a place for them hopefully will help. Great. I think it's just more about getting people to realise that there is a job out there that they can do in engineering. Because I didn't realise that this job existed when I was studying. It's only because um, I was looking around. I didn't even realise what I was applying for, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like a computer game job, so I thought, oh, I'll apply for that. And then it turned out to be, um, they were starting a new uh, F1 team. And I thought, oh, that sounds really, actually really good. And I, I never even knew it existed as a job. So I think it's just important to get that information out there and make people realise mm. that these jobs exist. Yeah, there are options for people, yeah. whichever, if if they're interested in STEM or even the non-STEM side, there are so many options for people yeah. if they're interested. Yeah, because I'm from a graphical background and I've ended up in F1 as well. So mm. you don't just have to do engineering to get into F1. Yeah. Hey, question number two. Hi, my name is Abana Zarantz and I'm based out of Florida in the United States. My question is, you ladies are a huge inspiration to me as a young female college student going into STEM field. What words of advice do you ladies have for women and girls like me trying to navigate through areas that were once male dominated? Keep up the amazing work. I know, it's very sweet. Advice? <laughs> um, mine would be um, to make sure everything you're doing is always something you enjoy um, and not to worry too much about other people's opinions and to trust in yourself. So maybe sometimes you'll come across obstacles, maybe people will think something of you, but you know who you are and you know what you can do. So trust in that. I think that's exactly what I would have said. Anna's just nailed it there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose for me, like along a similar kind of thread, but just having confidence that you have earned your place for where you are, because you know, whether it's getting a place at a top university, whether it's getting the job, like people will have assessed your technical abilities and that's, you know, they've, they've assessed you are strong and that's why you're there. So kind of having confidence in yourself and delivering your, your, whether it's your technical judgment, whether it's your ideas, like, you know, yeah, trusting that you're there for a reason. So this question is from uh, Sahithian in the UK. This is for Hannah. Uh, so what has been your most satisfactory strategy call? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like the one satisfactory. Because <laughs> um, I've got a feeling I know what the answer to this uh, is. So I think uh, previously I probably would have said Brazil 2019, which is maybe what you're expecting. No, but I think, uh, no. One from last uh, year, I'm now thinking. is Hungary last year. Um, so I think for us starting out of position it was a race which was quite a strategic race so there was more than one stop um so we got to make quite a few uh calls along the way and then for max to win after starting p10 when we weren't necessarily loads faster than other people but it was a combination of quite a few things and strategy was involved in that 
um for me that's when yeah it's an amazing buzz when you feel like you've really helped to achieve that goal and it's something you didn't expect going into the race I thought I remember someone saying where do you think we're finished I was like well hopefully we'll get we'll get on the podium maybe p3 that was kind of my best case expectation so the fact that we surpassed that was really great and how did you celebrate that evening (laughs) (laughs) I think we probably just got on a plane certainly Um, but I'm sure we had some bubbles on the plane naturally yeah of course yeah Uh, so this is from uh, Adderaman in Morocco this is a question for Anna Uh, do you think you can get the RB19 even more aerodynamic than it is at the moment (laughs) Yes, absolutely. I mean, if we can't, then I've not done my job well yeah. enough. So yeah, we're we're constantly searching for for more bits of performance that will stack up. So yeah, certainly more to come this year. Okay, there, there's us thinking <laughs> that it can't possibly get any faster, and you're saying it can. Okay, okay. Uh, this is from Adrian in South Africa. This is a question for you, Rosen. Um, So, how do you simulate? terrain that's always one of the least realistic looking things on video games so how do you create the effect of elevation changes in the simulator so there's a surface that you use that underlines the graphics so it's a separate thing to the graphics so the graphics are just the visual representation of what you're driving on and then you have an underlying surface that you actually do drive on and that's where we're getting the data from um and <laughs> i can't give any more details <laughs> it's quite um that would be telling what technology we use. Okay, no more secrets. Okay, okay. Uh, this is from Bart in the Netherlands. Um, th- uh, this one is for Hannah. So, with how many people are you in contact with during a race, or are you just reporting to one person directly? Oh, uh, no. So, the pit wall, we will be discussing things. So, I'll be discussing with the race engineers, with Christian, with Adrian um, on the pit wall about our decisions. Um, so, every time I've you know, had a thought. <laughs> I'll be communicating that and talking to people, making sure the race engineers know what the aim of this stint is. Everyone knows when the safety car windows will be open. And I'll be talking to Christian and Adrian about the bigger picture. So I expect Ferrari are doing this or Mercedes might be doing that. Uh, so we should do this. Are we okay to wait and cover people or do we need to be the proactive team here? the first person to stop, et cetera. So we'll be having all those discussions throughout. And then also, obviously, the operations room, for me, that's the important community, not that the other links aren't important, but it's a very (laughs) important communication link because they're going to be giving me all the information to make those decisions and to base those discussions on. So for me, all the information getting from them is really important. So sometimes a race can be very busy if you're having these discussions. So the operations room know when to step in and be like, I really need to tell you this. And you've been chatting on for ages. So let me get this information to you. Um, so, yeah, I think that there are quite a lot of voices. But at the end of the day, you can always tell people to stand by, and make sure you have the time to think and make the decisions because that's the important factor. Nice. Uh, this one's also for you, Hannah. So this is from Scott in the USA. So when two cars are far apart on the grid, like for Monaco, for example, who decides the two separate strategies that are going to be used so the person on the pit wall is making the strategic decisions for the team so that will be for both drivers then in the operations room we always have uh, one person looking at max and one person looking at checo and they will know all the information relative to that driver so where they'll pit when they come out if other people stop where they'll be relative to them so they have all that data and they're 100 percent always on top of that because obviously when the drivers are far apart, if you're doing the strategy for them both, you don't want to forget about one yeah. um, by overly concentrating on the other. So they're always on that and they will say to you, oh, actually, we need to think about this soon or that soon. But you're still the person making the decision. And the reason we do that is it's quite important that we maximise the points for the team and that is not seen as a competition between the two. So that's why it always works that way for us. OK, this is from uh, Priscilla in Mexico. Do you think that age is a determined factor to get a job in F1? So is the opportunity the same between young people or adults? I mean, I'm going to put this to all of you because you all kind of, you all joined at a reasonably young age, right? So would you say that the opportunities are the same for if you're younger, if you're older, whatever age you want to get into F1, if you want to get into record racing? I think as long as you've got the skills, it's always about what your skills are. And that's what you're judged on when you come for an interview. 
it's not about your age or how you look or anything else. So we also have the HP Poly Challenge, right? So this is our final game. So uh, HP Poly are our partners of the Talking Board podcast, and they are the leaders in video and voice solutions. Now, they want to challenge you, if you will. So we've got a HP Poly Bluetooth speaker here. What we're going to do, you can work as a team. It's fine. You're not going against each other. You can work as a team. <laughs> so we have a montage here, and there are four voices in this montage. And all I need you to do is tell me who they are. They are quite, well, they're very popular people here at Red Bull. So I need you to tell me who each voice is. Are you ready? Okay, have a listen. Step by step. It's incredible. More aggressive car. You call this a tickler. There was four voices in there. That's quite fast. <laughs> we can play it for you one more time. If you want to hear it one more time. Okay. Yeah. The last one you're missing. No, I've got the last one. So if you've got the I've third one. I've got the second one. one, definitely. I've got first, second, fourth. <laughs> okay. So then I think we've got it then. We don't Did, have you got the third? I thought it sounded like you've Pierre. Got, she's got the third, so I, I think don't, we don't even need it a second time, do we? You're that confident. Wait, well, no. <laughs> no. Less confident I mean, all. I mean, okay, so I who, mean, who's... Only if we get more points. If not, then we'll listen to it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> who had number one? Uh, I so we all yeah. have number one. I'm pretty sure yeah, I yeah. Max Verstappen. Max Verstappen is correct. <laughs> Voice number two? It's me. I don't know what I said to the production team. I was like, if she doesn't get her own voice, that would just be crazy. Because I know that sometimes when you listen to yourself back and you're like, do I really sound like that? I was wondering if you were going to get it, but you oh, did. I, maybe the fourth, I don't. I'm not sure about the third and fourth. I'd need to hear that again. Okay. But who <laughs> did you think the third that? was? I thought it sounded like Pierre. Our technical director, Pierre. Is the correct answer. Oh, yes, no. it is. Yeah. <laughs> and number four? I don't know. I need thought to it say sounded like DC, but maybe it's correct. It's correct. It's David Coulthard. I was then yeah. thinking uh, maybe because yeah, obviously you got four out of four, Fine. and you only listen to it once. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as if you know what you're doing. I kind of got thrown kind of by hearing Hannah, and then I was like thinking, "That's Hannah," and then I missed the, like, I missed the last two after that. <laughs> Shall we hear it one more time so we can confirm? Okay. Step by step. It's incredible. More aggressive car. You call this a tickler. <laughs> smashed it absolutely smashed it well done do you know what it's been an absolute pleasure having you three on the podcast thank you so much for joining me um have you enjoyed it yeah yeah, yeah. it's been, it's been really a good, good experience yeah. <laughs> yeah. i nice hope to speak break. to you again soon and talking ball we'll be back again next month <laughs>